you are about to meet a uh, renaissance man, someone who does things that nobody does, and you're going to get a kick out of it. Meet Eric Johnson. Hey, Eric. Hey, Eric. How you doing? Uh, Good. Well, we got double Eric's today. So, Eric, what are you going to do today? Today, uh, I'm, I'm going to be essentially working on a church altarpiece that I've commissioned for. Uh, I've been I've been working day and night, uh, just hours and hours. So I, I'm actually on one of my final passes for one of the portraits. So today I'm going to be demoing uh, how I approach the, the the flesh tones in the final and most important layer, the the subtle, um, almost glaze-like application to create you know a smooth transitions uh, in the flesh tones. Oh, that's exciting! I'm, I want to see that. I, I want to brag on you for just a second. First off, you're a phenomenal painter. Uh, I had put out the word. Uh, I wanted to do for Rembrandt's, uh, the 350th 50th anniversary of Rembrandt, I wanted to do a video teaching Rembrandt's techniques. And I put out the word into the marketplace and said, I'm looking for the best Rembrandt painter alive today. And your name kept coming back and back and back and back. So we did a video together, which I should tell everybody about. And uh, that video, uh, you painted this painting, this Rembrandt painting, that is a copy, and you showed the entire process, uh, and it's uh, on this video, Rembrandt Secrets Revealed, and it is absolutely fabulous, and it's fabulous because it's not only teaching you things that Rembrandt did, it's teaching you things that you can do, but what I love about you is that you're a purist, right? So you, uh, you grind your own paint, uh, you actually have a paint mill in your house or your studio, which is pretty cool. Uh, you grind your own paint. Uh, you find your own your your own minerals to grind. I mean, you're you're totally purist. And then you know you go through the layers and layers and layers and layers to accomplish. And I I'm the proud owner of that painting that you just showed. I just showed, uh, which is in my office right across from my desk, so I can look at it every day. And uh, so you're a true renaissance man. I think people are going to love watching you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to know that uh, know that the painting has a happy home. Um, surprisingly, uh, with, in the midst of the pandemic, I actually did have to sell my mill. So I had, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I actually had a three-roll mill where I actually uh, would make a lot of my paint uh, in mass quantity as opposed to hand grinding it every single day. Nowadays, uh, I'm actually working with natural pigments and Rublev colors as an ambassador. So one of the main reasons why I used to make my pigments and paint was primarily to avoid all of the manufactured, um, all the manufactured additives. So I like Rublev colors because they, they don't have any stabilizers, just pigment and oil. It's, it's just like I handmade the paint. Me having a, a three-year-old daughter and being confined to my home studio, I can, also can't deal with powdered pigments quite like I used to in, in a paint making studio. So if I need to mull up the colors, I, I usually just spit it out of the tube and then uh, I can add any you know historical additives, powdered glass, calcium carbonate, or any of the other uh, things to adulterate the paint in, in a handmade way, uh, straight out of the tube. Cool. So. Uh, I'm still oh. I'm still a purist, but I've got a more convenient way to you know get started in the day. Well, they make great paints. It's Rubelov, R U B E L U V, Rubelov. R U B L E V. R U B L E V. Here I'll show you. I have uh, I have the, the their container for the oleo gel. You guys can get the name R U B L E V, and uh, oleo gel is a great product too. Yeah. So, uh, Eric, why don't we get you started and uh, and let's see some painting. Uh, first off, should I, I? I'd like to show some of your work real quickly uh, while you're getting your camera set. Um, uh, this is your daughter, right? Mm -hmm. That is Beatrice. Be yes. Beatrice, and she's just turned three. Uh, this is your wife, Summer, mm -hmm. and uh, you know she lo if she looks like someone you know. Uh, think about it. Think about the name and the face, and it'll it'll tell you the answer. Uh, there's some other. I'll just show you a couple things. There's a self portrait, another self portrait. So you can see that Eric is very much in a Rembrandt esque uh, Renaissance style. He also teaches uh, at the Boston is it the Boston Realist School, the Academy of Realist Art Boston. Okay, 
And then here is the the uh, reference image of what you're working on now. Is that right? That's correct. Now, is that a painting or is that a person? Um, it's an actual person. It's actually the figure instructor at the at the school. His name's uh, his name is John Asimakopoulos. He's a really uh, talented and skilled figure instructor that uh, that we initially had as a student. Um, I painted him a lot. So when I got commissioned for this uh, altarpiece, uh, obviously yeah, being confined to the home studio in the pandemic, I can't work with um, live models quite like I'd used to. So I used a lot of models that I've already painted uh, frequently. And then what I did was I actually compiled some of the photos and actually did a digital painting on Photoshop to, uh, present, to, uh, to present to the architect and to the church. So I'm using the, uh, I'm using the reference as a guide uh, more so than uh, a, a strictly copying it. Okay. So I am doing a bit of idealization and making make it almost inventing the painting in in a way as opposed to just copying the photo exact okay. uh, but that's another reason why i like to let it go through the filter of actually doing a, a physically painted color study or doing a digital painting to where i can where my hand work is already on it i'm already you know stripping stripping away some of the unnecessary uh details if you will okay well why don't we get you set up i'm just going to make a quick announcement and that is that the winner of the value specs that help you see your values. Wow, when I look out at the snow, pretty incredible. Uh, the winner is uh, Mary Ann Lakey Baisley from Col Colorado. I wish we should pick easier names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today's prize is an easel brush clip from easelbrushclip.com. I happen to have one right here and uh, like holds that. your brushes and they're pretty cool. All right, Eric, let's do this. All righty. All right, here we go. Wow. All right. So I've already taken. I, I've this is this has been drying for uh, for a little bit, so it started to sink in. So the colors got pretty pretty matte finish. Uh, what I did was I oiled it out just uh, with a makeup sponge like this, and I used some of that same uh, some of the we're same not stuff. See, we're not seeing stuff. the makeup sponge. Would you show it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Using a makeup sponge like this, I apologize for that. Would you so explain? Would you explain what oil out means? So, when the when your painting dries, some of the oil actually gets sucked up into the surface. That's why if you use a lead primed uh, oil ground or even paint on metal or copper, you deal with much less sinking in. Now, sinking in is uh, essentially the scattering of light. So when your painting sinks in, some of the oil actually retreats into the, uh, the layers of paint underneath and the actual ground. So it's essentially like uh, a unpolyurethane uh, wood floor. Once you put the polyurethane on it, it brings out the richness and vibrancy of the wood. The same thing kind of happens when your painting dries. Some of that oil gets sucked up into the surface and that scatters the light due to the micro rough surface of the pigment um, kind of protruding off of the surface. All right. So what you do is you take a small amount of oil, or in this case, we're using oleo gel, which uh, I believe is proportions of 70% uh, oil and 30% fume silica um, to just uh, wipe it gently on the surface and then use the clean spot of the sponge to just wipe away the majority of it. Yeah, you got to make sure it's really dry, though. Otherwise, you're going to smear, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and, and another thing, I, I know a lot of people are, are, are big fans of using things like turpentine and odorless mineral spirits. One of the things that, that, that I've recently learned is that the use of uh, turpentine or uh, solvents or mineral spirits actually cause your paintings to sink in more when they dry, primarily because uh, they dissolving the oil causes the oil to actually get sucked up deeper or more so into the surface. So if you don't use mineral spirits, your painting won't sink in quite as much. Yeah, I'm I'm suffering with that right now on a piece I'm working on. It just keeps sinking in, and my colors uh, are just not they're flat. Yeah, it it it's it's a heck of a nuisance. What so I'm going to do is go I'm, through it real quickly. Tell us what your colors are, and uh, so from uh, from from right 
to left. Uh, we've got lead white number two. That's lead white bound in walnut oil as opposed to linseed oil. Uh, it's slower drying and will cause the uh, the white to yellow less uh, over time as opposed to linseed oil. Although uh, linseed oil, although it does dry faster, it will yellow a little bit more, but it is superior in its strength. So I've done almost everything on this painting in a lead white number one, which is a lead white in uh, linseed oil. Right next to that are two of my all-time favorite colors. This is lead tin yellow. This is uh, genuine Naples yellow. Here we've got uh, Blue Ridge yellow ochre, genuine vermilion. That's a mercuric sulfide pigment, Chinese vermilion, um, uh, very similar to like a Chinese cinnabar. Uh, we've very got poisonous. a... Yes, yes. So uh, all of these, uh, I mean, we've got lead, 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 mercury. Um, I... I think that it's so important to uh, tr treat all of your materials with a lot of care. Even the ones that are less toxic, um, I, I think a good habit is just treat them all as if they're ready to kill you. <laughs> um, I have a permanent alizarin. I don't use a lot of it. If I use uh, even a permanent alizarin, I'll probably only use it in very small areas um, where I just need a little pop, um, pop of chroma and darkness. And I'll, and I'll almost never mix the alizarin's permanent or impermanent or even a rose matter with any of the lighter colors. I'd probably only mix it with uh, things like my black. Uh, I've got a raw umber from Cyprus. Um, I, I, I go back and forth whether I get my raw um, or whether I use a raw umber from Italy, France, uh, Cyprus, uh, even uh, in England. They've, there's some really good uh, umbers that I like. And then on, on, at the end, I've got uh, bone black, sometimes commonly referred to as ivory black. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to uh, pre-mix up some r relatively decent flesh mixtures. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just uh, red and white, and I'm going to mix that together. Now, one of the one of the things that I find most important about mixing, uh, especially when your palette is relatively limited, which e even on a even on a good day, I, I don't use many colors. I feel very comfortable with uh, just a handful. When you use just a few colors, you, it's you realize it's very easy to create this kind of muddy, murky mess. So ideally, you should mix no more than two to three colors together in any mixture. And that will allow your paint to be uh, the most vibrant. And I've been told, I don't know if this is true, I've been told if you're going to do that, mix one color at a time and then combine them. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean. Um, well, in other words, like if you're going to mix, let's say you're going to mix a white and yellow, and then you were going to mix that yellow into the red. First you mix the white and the yellow, then you mix the white into the red, and then you mix the two combinations. Somebody said yes. it's a huge difference in, in how it how it turns out. That certainly helps with control. I don't do it. <laughs> um, I think that I think that I think that makes a lot of practical logical sense. Just just in regards with to, to control, and I'm essentially um, doing something very similar by just taking the time to mix um, a few different values of the same colors. So I, I'm just taking red and white, and then I'm just taking. Uh, my lin lead tin yellow and um, vermilion and just mixing them together just to get a, a kind of a peachier color and then, a, you know, a brighter, truer orange. These, uh, this will usually get me by uh, pretty, pretty far. What I can also do is take some of my umber, do the same thing. This time I'm not going to make swatches, but I'm actually going to mix uh, a, almost like a gradation. I'm going to mix a gradient. This is going to give me a very warm gray. I'm going to do the exact same thing for black. Some people are, are very kind of against black. I actually really uh, like the color. I think that if the intention and if the goal is to really create the illusion uh, of presence and absence of light, uh, 
having a black pigment is 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 really useful because it's it's a pigment that absorbs so much light that it, it essentially looks colorless until we start mixing some other color into it. You know, for example, we mix white into it and we can see that it has a, a bluer grayer appearance as opposed to, um, let's say, the umber. We have people watching today from uh, Hungary, one in Hungary, another in Budapest, Hungary, uh, Netherlands, Iraq. Hello, Iraq. Uh, let's see, Cyprus, man, I'd like to be in Cyprus about now, oh, uh, Saskatoon, Ontario, um, Switzerland, Pakistan, you got a big audience around Poland, uh, man, you guys, I really love it when you say where you're from in the comments, that helps, and of course, we're giving away, uh, today we're giving away an easel brush clip from the comments, so make sure you leave a comment, it's a great product. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the, the main brushes that I'm going to use today are, are actually a are actually a synthetic uh, a synthetic red sable. Uh, Trakel makes them. Uh, they're, they're no longer selling the natural red sables and kind of like what you were saying about me being a bit of a purist. Um, it's true. Uh, I am a natural hair type of guy, but they've they've now been making these synthetic red sables and I can't get uh, the, the natural red sables from them anymore. And I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm really liking, they're, they're called Sienna, uh, the Sienna brushes, but the, the, the synthetic red sables are, are really, really nice and, and frankly affordable, which I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to spend um, a, a crazy amount of money on brushes, but uh, I'm, because things are, are so, subtle and soft right now i'm going to use natural hair or, or or a synthetic that mimics a natural all right you better start doing some painting you're gonna start oh, losing am. audience here <laughs> so what i I'm can gonna bust do... your chops we're friends i can do that <laughs> what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna come to my lightest and darkest values so i'm gonna start by working around the eye so Using just a smaller round brush, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a mixture between my lead tin yellow and my genuine vermilion, and of course white being uh, you know addition to that. So I, I, I once again only have two colors plus white into that mixture. I want to make sure that my lightest areas are not leaning towards white, but are still leaning towards color or chroma. But I do want to start my day off by keying my painting, by uh, stating my lightest and darkest moments in the area and making sure that my lightest moments still are chromatic, meaning the intensity of the color is still uh, relatively vibrant or high. But I know that I do want to go just a touch brighter than I have right now. So I'm going to state some of the lightest moments around the eye and the forehead. I want to make sure that I keep that lightest moment away from, uh, let's say, the edge of the eyelid. If I were to take something extremely light and put it right up against something really dark, it would make the painting look a bit graphic or it would it would seem to flatten it. So we always need a transition uh, around every edge and around every volume. Once I've uh, once I've done that, I actually retire that brush. I save this brush for mixtures of lead, tin, yellow, white and vermilion. If I need a brush with pure vermilion and white, I will grab a brand new brush for that. What I'm, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go to some of my darker values. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a, a, a round brush. I'm going to make a mixture with now vermilion and black. And that's going to give me a, a pretty rich, vibrant red. Uh, and it will allow me to... Um, It'll allow me to keep this mixture simple. And uh, as opposed to lightening with white, I'm just going to lighten with more of my verm vermilion. Hmm. There's this weird uh, conundrum in, in painting. It's, you know, it's one of this aspect, the, one of the ass backwards way that you have to think. If you want your painting to look vibrant and bright, you actually have to do your painting darker than you think. So I'm, I'm really trying to make sure that I am achieving a, a rich and dark enough appearance around the eye and in the eye. Uh, 
as opposed to constantly just going lighter and lighter and lighter, because that ultimately will result in, in, a, in a chalky kind of deadish looking flesh tone. So what I'm doing is I'm going to go around uh, the eyelid. Now, because, because my mixture is only vermilion and black, I don't have to constantly be uh, wiping paint off of my brush. Uh, I can just add more or less vermilion or black into it. Um, and, and this brush, you know, essentially is uh, good to go for the entire duration that I paint with it, so long as I don't mess up too bad and uh, decide to put uh, eight different colors into it. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm just restating what I already have. So in this moment, it may not look like I'm doing all that much, but when you are furthering the development of your painting, and if you are uh, deciding to oil it out, uh, you're oiling it out because you like what you have down beneath and you want to continue it farther. So until this point, I, I really have not oiled out my painting and I've painted on it just regular sunk, uh, regular, you know, sinking in matte, very patchy, uh, patchy looking painting. But because I've oiled it out, I'm, I'm essentially stating that what was down below or what was already on the painting is, is worthy of uh, recapitulation. So I'm restating what I actually have to re-wet up my entire painting. That way I can continue um, what was not finished from the days before. All right. Hello, Chile. Hello, um, Norway. Uh, hello, Australia. She says she's having trouble with snakes and the, getting the dogs out. Oh, oh no. <laughs> We're just having trouble with snow. Eric, how cold yeah. is it right now where you are? It's uh, 12 degrees right now, uh, which is very unusual for Texas. And it's because the windmills froze up. You know, about 25% of the Texas power is based on windmills. Uh, but Texas very rarely ever gets cold like this and certainly doesn't freeze up. And so now they've discovered that windmill power may have its limitations in, in climates like this. Oh, wow. I didn't even think, oh. I don't even think of that as a factor, huh? Half of our city and, and half of my employees here have no power, no heat, pipes are frozen. Wow. So what I'm uh, what I'm doing is I'm I'm going to start stating the round spherical volume for the eye. I want to make sure that I don't paint the white of the eye just black and white or or just a cold gray. But I do want to make sure that I am using some flesh tones or some colors and mixtures that I would actually use in a flesh tone, actually in the white of the eye. That allows the uh, the eyes to seem less like they're made of. Um, porcelain or glass like a like a fake eye and and it almost makes it seem uh more so that the eye is sitting depressed in the orbit or in the uh, eye socket and that some of that light on the top cheek can actually bounce into it and color um color the uh, relatively colorless uh white of the eye i also want to make sure that i'm going dark enough around the exterior exterior perimeter, uh, especially far left, because my light source is coming from the far right. So when I am painting the eye, and when I'm restating these values, I am thinking of a conceptual idea of the spherical volume. Sometimes when you're working from life or, or even a, a photographic reference, if you have to work from it, uh, sometimes the, the amount of information can, can seem rather limited. Uh, areas like like the eye can be so small that, that that it almost looks like one just light shape. That's a uh, that's I, I would say always an opportunity for you to introduce some of the imaginative conceptualization. Uh, that way, you are creating the illusion of the sphere. So even in the even in something small like just the white of the eye, I'd I'd still be thinking about that large spherical volume that is sitting underneath. Eric, we have a question from someone who asked what you used for your underpainting. Uh, for my underpainting, I actually, I did, I, 
I did a fully colored underpainting in a, in a very kind of French academic, um, uh, in, in, a, in a very French academic way. So the area that was red fabric was essentially just scumbled the appropriate red fabric. The uh, the flesh tone and the light was just scumbled with uh, flesh tone. Same thing with the beard. So I only have um, two months to do this uh, to do this altarpiece. The center panel is five feet by seven feet, and then I've got two side panels, and and that's what I'm working here on. So. I would have done an underpainting if I had the time, but uh, oh boy, I don't have the time. Uh, so I actually did a, you know, almost a, a, a thin washi, uh, a boche layer uh, in the beginning. I did not use any mineral spirits. Um, if anything, I might have used a touch of linseed oil um, or that oleo gel just to, just to allow me to spread the paint a little bit easier. But for the most part in this painting, I have uh, I, I've tried to go with uh, as, as direct of an application of color as possible. Uh, at, before we end the broadcast today, we're going to show the uh, we're going to have Eric step back and show as much of the painting as he possibly can. We're getting requests for that. All right. Uh, all right. And maybe show us his workspace, your home studio. Right. Mm -hmm. We can certainly do that. All right. What I'm doing is I'm going around the eyelid just to put some darkness because the form of the brow turns in and in and in. And then the sphere of the eye balloons out again. So I just want to make sure that I have some darkness right on the edge of that form and put a little bit of the same darkness to work on that transition. I've used a new brush for almost every single color at this point. All right. Uh, that, is a, that is a very personal thing um it's, how do you it's very keep upset. track of them do you have a system for knowing which brush is which I, I i organize by temperature and i organize by value of so, course you do <laughs> uh, well, it's just it, you know it, it's just like the palette so it you know i i, I painting's hard enough when you don't have a system for organizing it, it's it's like it, it's like doing your laundry and just throwing them in your closet you organize where the shirts go, where the socks go. And, and the same thing on my palette. You'll notice that where I've got light colors up here, I have light mixtures here. Where I've dark mix or where I've dark colors here, I've got darker mixtures there. It's also separated from warm to cool. And I have a, a similar thing going on with the uh, brush array that I have. So I, I'll keep the dark colors together and then I'll keep the light colors together. And then I'll organize the, the warmer and cooler uh, brushes within that. Because right. I only have so many uh, mixtures and so many colors on my palette, it's actually not that difficult to to keep them very orderly. Who is the At character least, that you're painting here? Um, this would be uh, Joseph. All right. So it's it, it's a nativity scene. So I've got. I, I've got Joseph, Mary, uh, the three, the three wise men, the Magi, and then um, baby Jesus and a uh, an angel. So you had six figures. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. And how do you get a commission well, I guess, like that? I, I at the uh, at the school where I teach, we were actually contacted by an architect company. Who, who deals in, uh, in the remodeling of uh, churches, cathedrals, and things like that. And they were looking for uh, somebody to uh, paint an altarpiece for a new uh, remodel in uh, Highlands, uh, North Carolina. Nice. The church nice. is called uh, the Church of the Incarnation in Highlands, North Carolina. Well, you, you need to go down for the opening, but you need to wait until the weather's nice. It's a beautiful area. Yeah. It's cold I'm, I'm there really now. looking forward to it. It's going to be, uh, I, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be sad when my painting is gone, you know, spending some, it's always sad to see something, uh, you know, a painting that you love. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. Uh, I've got no issue selling my work, but there are some paintings that are undeniably, um, close or personal. And at, at this point in, in, in my career and my career in, in, in life, I, I really, I really want to do more paintings um, 
of my family and, you know, that, that, that connect me to, um, connect me to my own spirituality. So uh, a, a sense of devotional painting is something that I, uh, a direction that I really want my work to go in, in the future. So once to, you, to, uh, once you visit Soroya's studio in Spain, you'll realize the importance of family portraiture. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's got, paintings of his wife pregnant, his wife holding the baby, his children as grown-ups, and he always made time for that. And uh, when you see them all together, you realize how historically important it is because you, you get a sense of his, his family life. Mm -hmm. So you tie, you tie that together plus your spiritual life, you're going to have a really great record of your long life as a painter. Yeah, I, that's exactly that's exactly what I that's exactly what I think. You know, I've had many moments where I just sat down and just wondered, what am I, what am I going to paint? Why am I going to paint it? Um, why did I choose painting in, in the first place? And you know, I and I come back to just, um, you know, painting the things that I love and that that mean a lot to me. Mm -hmm. and, and and I found that I found that painting. Um, Painting with that intention allows me to put more love and care into my actual work. So I don't like to paint things just to sell them, but I like to paint the things that I, that I genuinely love and would want to see and invest time in. And that is that is mirrored when I, you know, when I'm even doing things like this. Like I'm I'm taking a lot of care in every single color and value. Now when I'm when I'm mixing flesh tones. Um, I don't want to say that I'm formulaic in the way that I apply them, but I do have a grammar of coloring in the way that in the way that I paint. So if my light source is relatively uh, cool, the general light family would be generally cool, and then my shadows would be generally warm. There's a constant opposition that you can see in nature of warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, and of course, warm and cool are relative terms, but I do follow uh, a certain principle in every single flesh tone or every single form that I paint. And I maintain a pattern of warm, cool, warm, cool from my shadows being warm and my half tones being cool, then my light, light family being relatively warm, then my highest lights being cool again. If you were to look at the work of Van Dyke, Rembrandt, um, Rubens, you know, Titian, uh, a lot of those older masters, the the, the 18th century or Coco painters, uh, almost um, uh, over exaggerated those relationships of warm to cool, uh, and and you know in that pattern uh, that it, that almost became too formulaic and almost uh, generic. But I, I'm 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 trying to main sen maintain a sense of law and integrity. In every single color that I paint, so I'm not looking for just just the right flesh tone mixture, but I'm also letting the painting uh, around uh, guide my hand to uh, make a decision of of which color to add into the mixture, uh, whether or not I want it to be warmer or cooler. Well, you just uh, show us real quickly with the other end of your brush. Uh, give us some examples of warm, cool passages where it's very, where, where it's going very, uh, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Variegated. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, this is helpful. So here on the finger, you can see, you can see that my light, uh, my light source is relatively cool. So I've got this shadow uh, that is warm. It's also getting a lot of bounced light, but the shadow here is relatively warm. And then the transition coming out of it is this, this almost greenish bluish hue. Yeah. And then we, then we jump back to the warmth of, uh, of the regular flesh tones. The same thing is going on here in the face. This transitionary hue here is relatively cool right before it meets the, uh, the warmth of the cheek. Very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep it kind of close up anyway. That's good. It's We can see it. Right. I want to remind you guys that we have a, a easel brush clip to give away to get today from easelbrushclip.com. And 
the way to win is to leave a comment and hope that we grab your name anywhere in the world. And please tell us where you're watching from. And if you're a first timer, please say I'm a first timer. So we know. When painting, uh, when painting relatively thin pieces of flesh, uh, for example, the eyelids, I think, uh, I think we can take a reference or uh, take a reference from Rubens when he said that you should paint flesh tone like a plume of grapes. If you ever painted a plume of grapes, you you realize that the uh, the grapes are filled with water. They're filled with uh, fluid, so the light can always uh, penetrate it. And then on the exterior or the shadow side, there's always going to be this kind of vibrant, warm hue. I think of that whenever I'm painting eyelids or a nostril or even an ear. Wherever there's a, a thin area of skin where the light can penetrate, uh, I like to paint those areas a little bit extra warm or a little bit extra red or uh, chromatic. That way it, it really starts to look like that is thin skin and that light uh, light can actually travel through it uh, uninterrupted on the other hand uh in an area that is very close to bone so if you were to feel on your nasal bone uh you know top of the nasal aperture or, or around the eye socket you'll notice in a lot of classical uh paintings and even on yourself you'll notice a very cool moment right in this area so what i what i'll do is i'll, I'll thinly apply a, a very kind of bluish, cool hue there. Uh, primarily to, to tell the viewer that that is an area that's very close to the bone and that the skin is transparent. Uh, question, do you take uh, consideration of the distance viewers are going to see the painting? Yes. Yes, that um, I was actually just talking to one of my colleagues about that because I'm I'm so used to doing very uh, highly refined um, detail work uh, for gallery pictures. But this being in a large altarpiece and primarily be, being seen either A, 10 feet up in the air or B, from 50 feet away as people are sitting in the pews. Uh, yes. Uh, so I find myself in this painting not... Uh, not blending or not getting hung up on too much of the the minutia and uh, I'm, I'm really trying to keep the the large effects and, and keep my keep my general shapes as as bold and as uh, relatively graphic as possible because if I fiddle it uh, too much it's just going to uh, look uh, look like mush from uh, from distance you now, see you artists do like any for, do you have to do any foreshortening on this painting because of the height that it hangs? Um, not not so much. Not 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 so much. I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be at uh, you know about waist height. Um, the center the center panel I have made the uh, the center panel is longer and taller, so I have made some of the um, some of the information a bit bigger. Uh, when it gets very high, um, and I've also exaggerated uh, some of the uh, some of the change from one plane to the next. Uh, I, I look at you know, let's say Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Th that is an example where he's over exaggerated the figures more so than any um, any of his other work, and it makes a lot of sense because those figures have to be legible and seen. Um, from great distances away. So did I ever tell you about our, our recent visit to the Sistine Chapel? No. I take an annual art trip, uh, take art collectors and art lovers uh, to museums and things in Europe every year. And mm -hmm. uh, last first time we were in the Sistine Chapel, uh, we managed to get the lights on, uh, which was unusual because they never do that. But the second time we managed to get a private viewing inside the Sistine Chapel, because the last time there were 50,000 people in there shoulder to shoulder. shoulder. So uh, we managed, because of our connectivity, to get a private viewing for our 50 people. So we were able to lay on the floor and look up, and, and wow. we got the lights on, and I did the first ever live broadcast from inside the Sistine Chapel 
it was so so rare that uh, Yahoo News picked it up and it went national. <laughs> so oh, it was wow. pretty cool. Of course, I got busted because they didn't they didn't want me doing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, what's what's done is done, right? That's um, right. Wonderful, wonderful. The, this uh, we 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 hope we're going to be able to take our trip this year. We don't know. I'm all, I, yeah, by the way, I've got a trip I'm taking to Russia. The trip is now sold out. We're taking waiting lists in case we can get some more people in. And, Congratulations. Uh, and uh, our fine art uh, trip, we don't know if it's going to happen this fall or not. But if so, we're going to uh, Vienna and Berlin and Dresden. It's going to be nice. Oh, exciting. Very exciting. Great museums. Yeah, we were we were wanting to uh, take a trip to uh, to Germany this summer, but we're 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 in the same boat where we don't know uh, whether or not you know it can happen. Right. So I'm you know, just hopeful, hopeful that yeah everything works out and the world you know gets back in order and we can go to the museums again and travel and be merry. Be merry. I'm merry no matter what. Yeah. You know, the goal of this broadcast is to help everybody be merry and not to get all freaked out about what's going on in the world. True, true, true. I must say that I've I've never had the amount of time to be in my home studio and um it's 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 been great for me to just be able to devote the time to my artwork. Yeah. Now, have you been able to to work with students? Are you are you doing them on Zoom oh, or what are you doing? Yep, yep. We're do so at the Academy of Real Estate. I'm good. I'm the primary person who's uh, who's doing all the um, critiquing and teaching at the school uh, for the online part of the program. Uh, we do have in person uh, with uh, limited capacity and. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of kind of safety measures to keep, you know, everybody from the students to instructors, uh, safe, but yeah, we're, our, our, our online classes are, are, are filling up, you know, they're, uh, the last trimester is already sold out. Um, and we've got lots of workshops, um, both in person and online that, that, that we're doing. I actually That's just, great school. yeah, it, it's, it, it's been really good. We were a little bit we were a little bit worried that it uh, that it wouldn't be wouldn't be like working from working in life, you know, actually going to the school. And and of course, nothing can compare to actually being there in person. But with the way that technology is now, um, it you can still get a, a, a whole lot of information and help and critiques on on what you're working on. And you know, be able to develop your your skills farther, you know, from the safety of your own home. So I've got a uh, I, I've I've got a, essentially a drawing tablet to where I can actually uh, draw on Photoshop, um, and and actually make uh, make their painting or their drawing lighter or darker, make something bigger or smaller. So it, it's really intuitive, and um, works out really really nicely. I mean, for, for demos and for workshops, we take this uh, similar approach where the you can see always see the palette and you can always see uh, the painting in the same view. So it's been pretty good. Shelly Cochran says, Eric Johnson is one of the finest instructors ever. Hi, oh, Shelly. Okay. I will see you tomorrow. Shelly's one of our, Shelly's one of the, uh, Shelly's one of the students. Uh. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, it's a biased, it's a biased answer, but I appreciate you, Shelly. And thank you. And I will see you. I will see you tomorrow. First thing in the morning. If you, so right guys now, I'm are, if you guys are enjoying this, please do likes and thumbs up and hearts and smiles and all that stuff. It's always nice to see it. Now, Eric, when do you anticipate this entire commission being finished? April 1st. 
Really? No, no, no April Fool's jokes. Uh, no April Fool's, Fool's jokes there. Right. Um, yeah. Um, there will be no sleep, Eric. <laughs> there will be no sleep. There will be early mm -hmm. mornings. Well, you're and young. I will stay, I will stay comfortably caffeinated. Um, Eric, you're under 30. You can, you can, go, you can go to April 1st without sleep. <laughs> it will be done. Um, they, they, that's the date that they need it. And that's the date that I said that I would get it to them. Uh, word is bond. It's not that it's easy, but it will be done in time. Um, without any, uh, without any worry. Um, I can, I can always put the time in. You know, this is, well, this is my life. Send them, a link, send them a link to this broadcast and they can share it with their, their, uh, the members of their church. And that way they can see a little bit of how it's painted. Oh, I am. I already planned on it. Yeah. This is my, my great marketing mind for figure out how to get <laughs> new viewers. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, All right. What I'm going to Eric is using Trakel brushes, and they are a synthetic red sable. Uh, there, the line is called Sienna. Sienna. I'm taking just a bit of pure, genuine vermilion and just putting it on the tear duct. I'm letting that be my lightest moment um, in the tear duct, as opposed to using white. Right. I may need to put a little specular highlight, just a little ping of um pure white and lead tin yellow but i'm letting the vermilion dictate how bright i can go i don't want to add anything into it because everything that i add into it will only uh, dirty it it will only decrease its intensity the color is never going to be more vibrant than um, it is pure and unadulterated I hope you guys are enjoying this. You know, I'm trying to give you a lot of different variety. You know, there's so many wonderful different styles and approaches to painting. Uh, what Eric's doing would be considered uh, tight academic painting. And uh, sometimes we have, you know, very loose abstract painting and everything in between. So it's nice to get a, a well-rounded education. Absolutely. Eric and I went plein air painting when he was in town to shoot his video. We went out plein air painting. Uh, to We were trying to paint blue bonnets, but there, there weren't very many, were there? <laughs> yeah. There, what did we drive around for four or five minutes oh, looking yeah. for a field of blue bonnets? And they were just nowhere to be found. Yeah. Why we had them this year. We had massive fields of them this year. I'm, I'm, and they'll be out. Uh, they they start coming out pretty soon. So, of course, right now we're having unexpected winter weather, and that's really good for blue bonnets. So, snow really? and blue bonnets. They tell us that before we spread our blue bonnet seeds to put them in the freezer, uh, they become really? more prolific that way. So, we'll see what happens this year. I'm wanting to get some um, Rembrandt tulips or some parrot tulips. Uh, for this uh, for this upcoming spring for still life painting, uh, put them in the garden. Well, Those I'm are sure another Boston, work. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna grow your own. How nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna strategically take them out of the freezer. That way, I can keep letting them sprout up because. because you know, uh, it takes me a long time to get a painting done, and tulips just come and go so fast. Yeah, they don't last very long. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a very greenish. So I'm taking the raw umber in, in white, and I'm, and I'm creating this greenish transitionary tone to make the front plane of the face just look a little bit brighter. The key is I want the, the front plane of the face to look brighter without actually making it brighter. I can do that by using contrasts. So what I'm doing is I'm darkening some of my transitions. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that warm moment. I'm going to take some of that raw umber again and mix some of my uh, genuine vermilion in with it. And I'm going to uh, switch my temperature again and move to a, a slightly warmer hue right on the cheek. Where do you purchase these brushes? Someone is asking. Uh, th that would be directly from Trakel. Okay. 
T R T R E K K E L L T R E K E L L dot com. Okay. They have been uh, a vendor at the Plein Air Convention. We'd love to have them back at some point. We'd love to have anybody back at some point, quite frankly, right now. <laughs> yeah. We had to cancel the Plein Air Convention this year. So we're doing Plein Air Live again. Uh, we've already got a stellar lineup of people, and it's going to take place in April. Uh, if you're going to do it, get signed up before the 28th because you'll save a bunch of money. That made a huge Those difference in the in the planes yeah thank you i was gonna say those conventions are really just so great you know having just been to uh the face conference or the face convention i i, I really i really enjoyed all that i got out of them and just to be able to speak and, and interact and, and learn from so many uh, great artists that are working today is, is really just, uh, you know, w well worth the price of admission. I think one of the best parts is, is not just the teaching and the, and the, um, you know, the onstage parts, but we've got a giant studio, which we've got, I don't know, I think last time we had nine or 12 models and mm -hmm. everybody's piled around all these models and painting at night together. And then, you hang out in the bar with all these well-known artists and get to know them. And it's really a terrific, a real gift. I hope we're going to be able to hold it. That's going to be in uh, uh, November in Williamsburg, Virginia. So we don't know. We're kind of waiting to find out. Beautiful transition. Oh, thank you. So I'm really just trying to keep, uh, you'll notice that the, the value, the value relationships are still tight but I'm constantly changing my color. I'm still doing that warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. You can see right at the perimeter of where I, I, I'm working right now. See that graphic boundary that I was talking about? That yeah. is what I'm working to transition. So I'm just trying to get just slightly lighter than that, but still keep my color relatively, uh, keep my color relatively vibrant. Okay. Now we've got about three minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. I know, doesn't it? Yeah. So why don't you come back on camera uh, so you can show us, give us a view of the full painting because we're not going to get this done today. You're not going to get it done for quite a while, I'm sure. Not till April 1st. Not till April 1st. That's right. Oh, give me, let me just give me one moment. Let me get this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the palette and I'm just going to... Uh, now he's shaking his finger <laughs> give me one moment let me just change my lens that way I can give you a good shot of it all right I'll tell you what because everybody wants to see this while you're doing that I'm going to take you off camera for just a second and then while you're doing that I'm just going to play something for everybody and then we'll be right back Painting outside is fun, and everyone is doing it. It's a great way to make new friends, be creative, and enjoy the outdoors. But painting outside requires different skills than painting inside, and it helps to learn it from the best. Monet and the Impressionist called it plein air painting, and the movement is bigger than ever. Now thousands are going outdoors to paint. Once you master plein air painting, your paintings will be transformed because you'll learn to see light, color, and form differently. At the second annual Plan Air Live, a worldwide virtual online art conference devoted to plein air painting. Three days of world-class artists demonstrating various techniques for outdoor and landscape painting. You'll get to know other artists and instructors personally through our breakout sessions and we'll even paint together at the end of each day. This year's faculty includes Kevin McPherson, Kathleen Dunphy, Joseph McGurl, Camille Priswadek, Christine Lashley, Michelle Uzabelli, Dawn Whitelaw, Lori Putnam, Dave Santianez, Phil Davidson, Don Demers, John McCartan from Australia, and more to be announced. 
Get private access to our exclusive members group to become part of our community. And learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Plan Air Live, April 15th through the 17th. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together. And for people who want to learn painting from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day on April 14th. We'll teach painting in different mediums like watercolor, gouache, pastel, acrylic, oil, and we'll teach subjects like trees, clouds, mountains, water, and more. You'll see your artwork get better faster as you learn from top artists from all over the world. Make history as part of the Worldwide Art Conference. Plein Air Live. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together. From the publishers of Plein Air Magazine. You have about 10 days to get the best price. Uh, the price at the end of the month, February 28th, goes up. So check it out. It's going to be phenomenal because we had to cancel the plein air convention. Uh, this is the way we get the family together, and it's a really cool thing. We have breakout rooms. We get to know other artists. We have artists teaching from multiple countries, and there's many more to be announced. So go ahead and get signed up at pleinairlive.com. Back to, to Eric Johnson. Uh, okay, Eric, you're in your studio. So I just want to show this is my setup for teaching. This is where I will I will do all of the uh, the drawing on and critiquing for my students. Um, so as we turn around, there's the painting of my wife. Forgive the glare. Uh, I've got a, a, my my treasure trove. This is where all I keep all of my pigments uh, and, and important and hazardous hazardous things. So here is here's the way the painting the painting looks from a distance. Yesterday, I was working on this. So I'm the, waiting the, to start. The two, the two paintings on the side are the side panels. Exactly. And then, the big, and then one, and the big one in the middle will be the big one. Yes, Lord, help me. Lord, yeah. help me. Yeah. Month and yeah. a half. April 1st. <laughs> so I've wow. spent a lot of time working on working on the red fabric on this one recently. Still have a lot to do on the flowers. As you can see, it, it is, you know, just like I said, just a, a thin, washy layer um, in the beginning. And then I'm going to get, you know, real and fake flowers and, and just paint all of that um, from life. So although I'm using some photographic reference for, uh, for, uh, for the portraits because I have to. I am using fabric and I, I, I've got a lot of other objects to use for um, for the fabric and for, you know, the um, just all of the other things regarding flowers and everything. Outstanding. Well, why don't you come back on camera and we'll say goodbye. Hopefully. <laughs> Are you coming back? There he is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay, well, uh, Applause to Eric Johnson. Uh, this has been a double Eric show, and Eric's been a pleasure to have you here today. And we're learning a lot about painting just from watching those transitions, the warms and cools come together. And uh, we can learn about Eric at uh, his website, which is um, Eric Johnson Fine Art. All right. And, that, and you probably have links to the school and some of the other things that you have today. Yes. All right. So I want to tell you guys, uh, Eric, I'll tell you too while, while you're on. Today's going to be a real treat. Uh, we have uh, today, well, first off, back in March, I went over to, to uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and did a film with Nikolai Blochin, the great Russian master. And, of course, they paint a lot differently than Eric because it's bold, bold, loose, uh, but they're trained in every detail that Eric's trained in. And Blochin was, uh, for many, many years, the drawing instructor at the greatest art school in the world, which is the Repin Institute, where Ilya Repin uh, uh, attended. And uh, so Blochin is going to be on today at 3 o'clock. We're going to show segments of the video. Uh, but Blochin's going to be on actually answering questions in the comments today. And that's a very rare thing. So you don't want to miss that. He's going to we're going to show how he did this painting. This this painting's about five feet, four or five feet tall. 
and it's from this video. So uh, you're going to like that. Eric, I know you would love it. I know you're going to be busy painting, but you'll be carefully listening on the side. I'll keep that. I'll keep the monitor on. That's that's all I've been doing. That's all I've been doing is you know I put you on uh, you know every every single day. It's pie. It's it's podcast and everything. Just you know just I, I I keep I've got so many monitors at this point that I can just always keep something interesting on to get away from my sterile music choices. So that oh, I, yeah. I I keep listen to the same thing over and over too many times. So I, I switch it up. Well, you've been a real treat today, and I appreciate your friendship. Uh, hope we can get together and go painting again after you get this big piece done, maybe this summer. And uh, Eric, it's been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for all having right. me. Thank you all You're for joining. You're welcome. I'm honored. Our guest today was Eric Johnson, and uh, you would, I, if you came in late, watch the whole thing because you'll get a lot out of it. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher, a fine art connoisseur in Plant Air Magazine. I'm here every day. This is day 328. Coming up is day 350, big day, and then 365, an even bigger day. One year of, of showing up for you guys daily. Uh, we have been doing it every day at 12 noon and every day at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Uh, is seven days a week. The 12 noon is now five days a week. After seven months, it was like, okay, got to take a weekend off. So anyway, still here for you, trying to keep your head in the game, keep you positive and upbeat, and really uh, trying to distract you from all the craziness and the coronavirus and the quarantines, give you something to do. We've heard from people all over the world, literally all over the world, who have picked up a brush for the first time ever, because watching has given them the courage to try it. We've seen people who have uh, picked up a brush for the first time in many years, sometimes 20, 30, 40 years. We love to see that. We, we know that when people paint, their spirit is just better. Their, their hearts are filled with, with joy because they're doing something they love. And so that's the purpose of this. And hopefully you're enjoying it. And I will see you tomorrow. Uh, assuming the electricity continues to hold out here. We're lucky we've got it the whole time. We have heat. It's not very warm in the house, but we have some. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow. And thanks again to Eric Johnson. Bye-bye.